everyone, my name is Jen Artan, and this best practices webinar tonight, or today, whenever you happen to be looking at it, will be about personalized learning strategies with adult language learners. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, well, what exactly is personalized learning? Um, and, you know, how are we already using personalized learning strategies within the adult language learning classrooms? We're also going to look a little bit at how we can make it better and how can technology help or hinder the process of personalized learning. And finally, we're going to look at what you can do as an educator to enable personalized learning in your classroom with your learners. Like I said, this webinar is part of the Best Practices Directory of Resources and is funded by the Ministry of Citizenship and Immigration Canada. Thank you very much for that. Uh, join the conversation by clicking on this link. I'll provide it in the webinar resources. It is a Padlet which will be um, populated with, with various resources and activities, tasks related to personalized learning. Okay. So, a little bit about me. Uh, that's me. My name is Jen Artan. I am the Tesla Ontario webinar manager, one of them. Uh, continuing education instructor with Thames Valley District School Board, a Google certified educator at level two, and a general tech explorer. You can find me on Twitter at Jen Artan. Uh, actually, <laughs> Twitter is likely the best place to get in touch with me if you have a quick message uh, because all my notifications are set to this thing here. So when I get a message on Twitter, I get it right away. Email, it might sit there for a few days. Just saying. Okay, so to begin with, what exactly is personalized learning? This is likely a concept that has come up uh, within your teaching practice before, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about well, what it means. And personalized learning has become a buzzword in the past few years, particularly within the K-12 sector, but also in higher education. It has not made a great deal of headway in adult and continuing education at this point. The reason personalized learning has become a popular idea is not because of the concept of personalized learning itself, which I will get to has been around for a long time. It's because technology has developed in a way to make personalized learning a real possibility for each learner in the classroom through what is known as adaptive technology. In this webinar, I will further outline what is meant by technology-enhanced personalized learning, how feasible it is to adapt to adult and continuing education, what the advantages and disadvantages of this tool could be, and what you as an educator might do to enable PL in your classroom in particular, especially if your classroom is at maximum capacity. This quote here by Stephen Downs, you might recognize the, uh, the theorist. Um, I think it's a good way to start any conversation about personalized learning. He says, ultimately, if people are to become effective learners, they need to be able to learn on their own. They need to be able to find the resources they need, assemble their own curriculum, and forge their own learning path. They will not be able to rely on education providers because their needs are too many and too varied. And this, uh, for me, represents many of my classrooms, especially within the last few years, right? So one of the challenges with talking about personalized learning is that, well, if you Google the term, there are so many different definitions of personalized learning. Um, so we're gonna talk about some of the few common elements. One of the most common themes in defining personalized learning is the idea that the current educational practices are mostly a one-size-fits-all approach where out of necessity, the teacher attempts to reach the majority of the median student, typically leaving um, outliers bored or frustrated. In a room of 30 learners, all with different prior knowledge, skills, abilities, and interests, is it really enough to take a needs analysis poll at the beginning of a term and then draw on the majority of the input? That may, that may work okay if, you know, 80% of the class has indicated an interest in the topic going to the doctors, but this is usually a first past the post kind of deal, right? With maybe only 40% of the class of 30 
uh, selected this as their number one choice from a list of predetermined needs, while the other 60% might have chosen something else. This would mean that for whatever reason, a large number of learners in the class is not interested in the chosen module, probably because they've done it before, right? And their needs are not going to be met as effectively as they could be. Student-centered learning, as opposed to teacher-centric, right? The role of the teacher has changed from sage on the stage to guide on the side. This does not make the teacher's role any less important. Competent, experienced teachers are needed to help the learner on their journeys. While we may not, so while we may not now possess all functional, grammatical, and pragmatic knowledge available, thanks a lot, Google, we still have a vital role to play. If you are an adult and continuing education instructor, you are likely familiar with the theory of adult learning as put forth by Malcolm Knowles, otherwise known as the father of andragogy. Andragogy is more a set of assumptions in how adults learn. Um, like I said, you've probably all heard this before, so I'll just be brief. Adults need to know why. When the why is confirmed, then they're more ready to be engaged. Adults need to see the immediate and practical relevance of their learning, partic particularly how it can be applied to their everyday work lives or social lives here in Canada, right? So effective learning is self-initiated and driven by learner needs and learner interests. When adults have autonomy in their learning journeys, they are more engaged. As Knowles argues in his approach, having the choice in what one learns, how one learns it and when makes an impact because then the process is more directly relevant to the learner's life. Like I said, whether it be in the workplace or everyday survival skills here in Canada. Because our learners are a broad spectrum of prior knowledge, skills, abilities, and interests, being able to work at their own pace is a key part of the definition of personalized learning. If a learner already has a particular functional skill mastered, they would be bored waiting for the rest of the class to catch up. The same is true in reverse. If the learner is lagging behind, then they feel frustrated and can take their lack of progress personally. Being able to work through specifically targeted modules or chunks at their own pace the responsibility onto the learner and also take some of the pressure off. This is a challenge in adult ESL because of the required amount of time to be served in a, in a particular COB level before progression decisions can be made. Another part of the definition of personalized learning is the focus on mastery or competency-based learning. So essentially, rather than failing an entire course because you had a bad final exam, uh, and then having to go back and repeat it from the beginning, including the, the foundational stuff that you might already be okay with, um, you only need to repeat the, the units in which the, you haven't gained mastery. So that's what's meant by competency-based or mastery learning. A focus on um, formative rather than summative assessment as well. Personalized learning is said to be able to take advantage of various learning styles, offering choice in how material is used by the learner text, video, gamification, etc. Note, <laughs> and big note here, um, this is actually a very common reason for a rationale for personalized learning, is this focus on individualized learning styles. There has been a lot of um, debunking of the learning styles myth, and I will provide some resources if you want to kind of look at that information. Um, but the idea is that there's going to be some differentiation. It's not all going to be lecture-based. It's not all going to be audio. It's not all going to be uh, reading text. There's going to be a variation uh, in, in how the material is presented. But like I said, the learning styles theory has been debunked. So if you're still trying to figure out if you're an auditory, um, kinesthetic, tactile, whatever, whatever else you, that might be out there, um, don't worry about it so much because depending on the tax, the task, the context and the situation, you know, we all learn in different ways at different times, depending on what the objective is. So personalized learning is student-centered, needs-based, self-directed, self-paced learning, focusing on mastery, competency-based learning units, accounting for different learning styles in a classroom where every student is engaged and where it would be impossible to have a one-size-fits-all approach. Notice that the idea of technology has not yet been introduced. Without technology, uh, without technology in a classroom with 20 to 30 adults, 
doing all of this would take a great deal of effort and an inability for the teacher to perhaps clone herself several times throughout the day in order to meet the uh, various numbers of, of student needs. Right. But we're not talking about teacher cloning yet. So how can personalized learning be actualized? Two ways, smaller classrooms and adaptive technology. We know that smaller classrooms work. Literacy classes often have a cap on the number of students so do some SLT classes. Montessori has been personalized education for years. Um, individual attention, project-based learning. John Dewey suggested it many years ago, so did Vygotsky. But given that in our reality, smaller class sizes just isn't gonna happen. Be nice, you know, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, give us smaller classroom sizes, right? Just imagine the possibilities. The alternative is, technology. But before I talk about the specific technology, I want to highlight what adult and continuing education is doing right when it comes to personalized learning. PBLA, Portfolio Based Language Assessment, acknowledges that learner needs are critical and that learners should have a say in what content is provided in their English language learning classrooms. There are needs assessments, activities, forums, and discussions that occur in classrooms at various points throughout the year. As I mentioned earlier, this is a good start. But since the teacher, out of necessity, needs to determine curriculum, this is a first past the post kind of situation where the majority, however slim it may be, rules. So ultimately, then we're back to a one size fits all approach teaching to the median and leaving many in the classroom as outliers. Also, progression is not just determined by an end of term outcomes exam plus attendance plus classwork. Progression is now determined by attendance plus number of artifacts contained within the learner's binder. Eight to 10 is the magic number. This evidence-based progression is meant to showcase the learner's KSAs, knowledge, skills, and abilities, developed throughout the level with ongoing formative feedback. However, since progression is based on number, have we turned the formative assessment back into a summative one? Along with promoting learner autonomy, PBLA also emphasizes formative assessment rather than summative assessment. That's through, uh, that quote is from Joanne Pettis in 2014. What we can improve. When we talk about per, uh, personalized learning, pace, uh, the self-paced students able to work through a level at their own uh, speed, this is something that we want our students to be able to do. Uh, however, within PBLA and within the other approach as well, there are roadblocks for progression, including the waiting period. Once a binder has been submitted for, um, for progression, um, this is usually a process that takes time, weeks, or a month, um, depending on uh, how busy your site is and how many PBL leads that you have that are helping with the progression. PACE is also directed by funders, right? There's a requirement to have a specific number of hours in a CLB level before progression. So even if our learners are flying through a particular level, perhaps misassessed initially, right? Um, there are not a lot of opportunities for these learners. I mean, there are some, there are certain situations where learners can progress up, but for many, uh, this doesn't actually happen. Learner needs. I touched on this earlier. Difficult to implement in large classroom sizes without technology. I had the opportunity to meet with Tarek, H Tarek Haddad uh, of the um, company Peace by Chocolate in Toronto this past summer and his comments on what he thinks would make uh, the ideal language classroom really struck home with me. He also talked a lot about individualized attention, uh, smaller classroom sizes, the use of volunteers, uh, which would be fantastic if we had access to that. However, what we know is that course modules and content is often created based on a majority of learners at the time of the needs survey. Um, and depending on the level, students might not really understand what they're doing during this needs survey. 
Continuous intake also shifts the class composition regularly so that it's a challenge to be able to meet all needs of all learners at the same time. So like I mentioned before, first past the post does not accurately reflect the needs of all the racers or voters. <laughs> and this is a given. What do we need to improve? Material available. Vetted, CLB appropriate, real world material geared towards learners' needs and interests. Now, there is an attempt, there are attempts, sorry, being made right now to create repositories such as the best practice uh, Tesla Ontario repository and the many resources that are now available in Tutela. Um, initially, when PBLA was rolled out, uh, a pre-prepared curriculum was not uh, something that was presented as uh, likely to happen since what you teach isn't necessarily apparent until you've met your learners. Curriculum then comes after. So I think that there's a shift right now to provide resources and materials in a number of different thematic units which makes a lot of sense um, and will take a lot of pressure off teachers to come up with this resource on their own. Delivering personalized learning to a class of 30 plus adult learners is a difficult challenge. Technology can provide some insights into how a learner learns and provide pathways for the learners to follow based on their interests and needs. The most obvious place to begin is within a learning management system such as Moodle, which is offered to all LINK instructors across Canada on edulink.org. Highly, highly recommend it, especially if it's your very first foray into learning management systems. It provides a wealth of pre-prepared SCORMs, tasks, uh, and it's just a phenomenal resource. If you haven't already taken advantage of this, what are you waiting for? Come on, it's there, <laughs> uh, unless you're not LINK. If you're not LINK, yeah, oh well. Um, there are other free platforms that include Canvas, Edmodo, Schoolology. These, there's free versions of all of these programs. There are other versions of LMS, there are other, sorry, there are other LMSs such as Blackboard, Desire to Learn, Brightspaces, but these often come at a significant cost to the organization. But they also have some really cool features. I've used Desire to Learn before, really, really liked it uh, with my learners. Uh, through the school board. From the LMS comes the opportunity to discover the learner's patterns and preferences through the use of adaptive technology, the analytics that are produced that track a student's movement within the platform. So like I said, there are a number of different options, edulink.org, that's where you can find uh, Moodle, Canvas, Google Classrooms, Schoolology. All of these can be used to help provide uh, the learners with more agency, flexibility, and choice. This is a video produced by IBM. Now, in this video, IBM is actually talking about the K-12 sector, talking about how in the future the classroom will learn you. This is a short video that kind of outlines the, um, the role that analytics and adaptive technology can play in the classroom. It's an interesting um, view by IBM, uh, if not, um, overly optimistic, <laughs> their timeline for this to happen is within five years. Now within K-12, maybe there's a chance that this will happen within five years. Within higher education, it's also possible. Within adult and continuing education, not a chance. We're not there yet. Educational technology today allows for the use of algorithms to determine how a learner is interacting with the material provided and offers analytics to the teacher while the learner is navigating the competency or mastery-based course modules so that the problem areas can be better addressed. Learning management systems such as the ones I've mentioned, Desire to Learn, Blackboard, Canvas, Edmodo, Schoolology, Moodle, etc., all offer platforms in which to house learning content, giving the teacher insight into individual students that has not existed before, right? such as how long it takes learners to progress through the modules, which areas are the most problematic, and how often a learner returns to a specific section, the number of contributions students make in discussion forums, 
time of day that the student is engaged in the platform, and a whole host of other learning analytics. The goal is straightforward enough to provide the best possible support for the learner in acquiring the learning objectives of the content. Analytics then is the aggregate data gathered from a learning management system that can provide statistics on many areas, including what I mentioned before, but again, to review when and how often learners log into the system, how much time they spend on specific modules, scores on quizzes, and number of attempts. This is an interesting quote from the e-learning industry, keeping in mind the, the source, you know, so yes, there is bias here for sure, but uh, just talking a little bit about what data analytics mean. I'll just give you a moment to pause this and read it. You don't need me to read it for you. Predictive analysis is something like your smartphone's predictive texting feature. Based on the letters you're typing, the tool will attempt to predict what you're trying to communicate based on the aggregate data from millions of users worldwide. Though this does come with some interesting and not always accurate results. I have a challenge for you. Listener to this webinar, take out your cell phone right now. Take it out, right? Open up like a messenger or uh, some other texting feature that you use. And I want you to type in these words. Type in the phrase, my dream is to. Okay, those are the words I want you to type and then continuously choose the middle predictive suggestion. I'll give you a moment to do that. And then I'll tell you what it said for me. So pause. Predictive analysis came up with this winning uh, gem here for me. My dream is to be a little late this week, but I'm still sleeping on my bed now, and then I'll go eat some lunch which remarkably <laughs> was my day today. Maybe there's something to be said for predictive analysis. Right? How do they know so much? In plain English, analytics have the ability to see how a particular student learns and then provide suggestions based on learner weaknesses or strengths to, in order to help improve. So this is what's known as predictive analysis. It's real-time feedback, ideas, and suggestions and this is what IBM meant when they said, the classroom learns you. Data analytics identify how learners interact with training content, learning activities, and with each other. Seeking information on such interactions help educators develop an accurate understanding of learner needs by providing trainers with the ability to monitor and compare success across varied methods of instruction. Uh, learning analytics can help improve the quality and impact of the courses. So basically, learning analytics can offer deep insight into learners' uh, performance and helps organizations to track and evaluate performance. So learner uh, analytics isn't just happening in education. This is happening in the business world too. So online business training programs often take advantage of learner analytics to see how their staff is, is using the training provided to them. Yeah. And so Professor Timothy McKay at the University of Michigan um, was talking, uh, he, he has his own theory on, on how analytics can help him. Uh, and he's the one that suggested that previously university courses, because of the sheer sizes, aims at the median student with the outliers, like I mentioned earlier, often getting left behind. So essentially what Tim McKay is talking about, he, he has a class of 400 first year physics students. Um, and he says that without personalized learning analytics, it would be impossible to reach, to reach them all and that they would have to, out of necessity, attempt to reach the median student. Analytics changes that. Analytics uses um, technology to be able to reach the needs of each and every single one of his students. Now, uh, I would not, I don't envy him as a, having a class of 400 first year students. Um, but having a class of 30 would definitely also be a challenge. Right. So what do learner analytics actually look like? If you were using the free LMS Canvas, you would be able to highlight what one student has been able to accomplish within the course platform. 
like I said before, such as how often they logged on, how often they communicated in the forums and chats, and what their grades are. Now, let me just try to zoom in on this for you so you can get a closer look. OK, so you can see this is demo student number two, current total. There's an email up here at the top, activity showing the page views. Uh, orange bars represent action, perhaps, that the student had done in that particular day. Uh, lots of action on that one day. Communication, student sent messages, messages from instructors, right? You can go in and you can look at the messages. Assignments, on time, late, missed assignments, that sort of thing as well. Grades. Canvas will also tell you how many times a learner has viewed a particular page, how many attempts at a specific quiz, and whether any online work is still outstanding. Keeping in mind, analytics are not perfect. A student could view a page, print its contents, and then view the paper copy many times, and the teacher would have no idea. Or a PDF might be printed and shared with other learners, making it appear as though some have never accessed the course material. This is a limitation if the teacher is using this to assess and grade course participation. Moodle analytics can also generate similar stats, such as, you know, when the student logs on, how often they log on. This is from, uh, the source is given here at the bottom, I believe, right? Some assignments allowing you to, um, Login statistics, learner engagement, learner overviews, and that sort of thing. Some more statistics in Moodle, just kind of uh, kind of let you see here a little bit. Course averages, grades. Um, this is one exam, maybe how well they've done. That sort of thing there as well. With any technology that we want to implement in our classrooms, there will always be an issue of quality professional development and support. The edulink.org link group offers training and ongoing support, but if you're on a different platform, you might be on your own to locate and access training. As I'm speaking right now, I'm waiting patiently for the yearly Edmodo conference, which is an all-day training event that has an incredible lineup of keynotes and speakers. It's online, it's worldwide, it's just fantastic. I don't even use Edmodo. I've been using Google Classroom, and I'm about to switch over to Canvas. But the learning that comes from this event is always excellent. When we as educators are able to provide a more truly personalized learning experience, the benefits, the potential benefits are significant. We're talking agency, flexibility, pace, autonomy, choice, and voice and a more realistic workload for the teacher, provided that resources are available. I'll just pause this and let, uh, sorry, you can just pause this and um, read the quote from Peggy Grant on personalized learning, a guide to engaging students with technology. So where are we now? Well, personalized learning using adaptive technologies is in its early stages. Like I said, hasn't exactly um, been very popular within adult and continuing education yet, although I think it is coming. Uh, advanced analytics that come in expensive LMS packages are not necessarily available to all of us. So while you can have access to some of the free analytics in Moodle and in Canvas, um, maybe some of the more uh, advanced analytics that come out of Desire to Learn or Blackboard or other programs, um, we don't all have access to that. If you are in a link classroom, you already have access to Learn IT to Teach, which will provide you a learning platform on Moodle at www.edulink.org once you've completed their training. I highly recommend it. It's definitely the best way to get started and get familiar with learning management systems, and the support that they provide is just, um, just amazing. Right? Like I said, there are other options for technology-enhanced personalized learning. The free ones available, I've mentioned this throughout this presentation, include canvas.infrastructure, Edmodo, or Schoolology. Some of you have noted that I've mentioned 
using Google Classroom? Well, it's important to, uh, to tell you that, that Google Classroom is not a learning management system. It's more a repository that has forums and discussions. Um, I love Google. I love using Google Apps for Education. But at this time, Google Classroom does not yet provide analytics and isn't organized in the same way that an LMS is. It's for this reason that I'm switching to Canvas infrastructure um, in the fall because I've used it within my Masters of Education program. And I know that Google Apps are easily incorporated, incorporated into the platform. So Google Forms and Google Docs and Slides and everything else that I use in Google, I can easily use in Google uh, and Canvas. So that's my plan going forward. So using an LMS will allow you to create learning pathways for your students, complete units with all of the supporting skill building functional knowledge that are required for a specific task. The downside, this takes time to assemble. The upside, once it is, learners can have more flexibility to work through their language journeys at their own pace, pursuing topics that take their variable interests into account, and provide them the flexibility to work anytime, anywhere on their personal computers, tablets, or smartphones. Another upside, why do we as teachers often work in isolation? I can add another teacher to my learning platform and enable a teacher to make changes or to even duplicate it. Um, this could result in a fantastic wealth of resources, tasks, and activities. Um, collaboration is a 21st century skill. I'd love to see more of this happening. If any of you watching the webinar are interested in collaborating in a canvas.infrastructure classroom, let me know because I am here to, to share what I'm doing, to improve what I'm doing, and to learn from you as well. So just send me a note, an email, a tweet, and, and we'll set something up. Like I said, with literacy, specialized language training programs, having a personalized learning management system is an excellent way to curate relevant resources for the learners that will enable them to use them on their own time and work throughout through their, with their own pace through a particular unit or module. Um, I would suggest that you take time to go through the CLBs and find out what functional, grammatical, pragmatic knowledge is required at the levels and incorporate that into your, um, to your learning chunks that you can develop. And if you're deciding to use one of the freebie platforms such as Moodle, Canvas, Edmodo, or Schoolology, I'd suggest starting with the basic analysis uh, analytics to get a clearer pictures of your learner's strengths and weaknesses and share it with them, right? So when you're doing those interviews face-to-face -face time, have the learner's uh, profile there on a computer, share that information with the learner and use that uh, as part of your formative assessment. What's next? OK, who knows? <laughs> um, we know that indiv individualized learner attention results in better learning and higher achievement. This much is obvious. We know this. Technology is one way to help isolate learner needs and adapt learning to meet them. But it's not the only way, right? Pedagogy before technology, or in our case, andragogy, right? Smaller class sizes can also help to adapt, so it can also help personalize learning. Um, it's just not likely to happen in our reality uh, of adult and continuing education. But it'd be nice, you know, again, like I said, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> the personalized learning industry is still new. Its claims are still largely untested, especially within our context, adult and continuing education. What the future will hold still remains to be seen with many centers still without universal Wi-Fi and which lack adequate teacher training. What we know is that our learners are increasingly connected and increasingly desire to forge their own paths. The role of the teacher is changing. We've been seeing that over the past few years, stage on this, sorry, sage on the stage model was killed by the uh, search engine. Teachers need to see themselves as the expert partner in the learning journey, guiding and facilitating the learner so that they can find their own way. 
I've been fortunate to have smaller class sizes due to my work assignment in specialized language training. So I've seen firsthand how individualized plans and attention can help improve learning outcomes. This I discovered before my class incorporated a blended learning uh, component. However, I have also discovered that learners want to take their learning online. They want to have the flexibility to choose their own path and pace of learning. From my own learner analytics, which are basic, I'm not a math person at all, um, I've come to notice that many have busy family lives and often do their online work in the late hours of the night, uh, early hours of the morning. It's not uncommon to have assignments turned in at 3 a.m., um, 1, 2, 3 a.m. Of course, they could be doing the same thing with pen and paper. However, knowing their schedules makes me more empathetic. I've also had learners connect to the classroom tasks using their mobile devices while waiting for doctor's appointments, as a passenger on a long drive, on the commute home. It's clear that learners access, um, it's clear, sorry, that learner access, when flexible, allows students more choice and control over when they can manage their learning time. It isn't just between nine and three anymore. Providing learners with the ability to identify their language weaknesses and some resources to focus on improving those weaknesses help students become more accountable and more in control of their learning journeys. Whether they choose to use media-rich videos, text, games, or whatever else they prefer, providing some differentiation on a learning management system adds variety and hopefully keeps learners engaged. The biggest issue we have, however, is getting those CLB-appropriate resources and embedding them on an LMS. That's a major hurdle, but one that isn't impossible to overcome. Once we have the resources and materials, personalized learning plans can tap into and address our specific newcomer learner needs in a way we've never been able to before. And the resulting adaptive technology or analytics can help the teacher identify trends, provide appropriate support, and help the learner meet their language goals. One step at a time, it's worth investigating. Let me know what you think. Here is the link to the Padlet. And you can contact me at these two email address or find me on Twitter at jenartan. Sorry, at jenartan. That's, that's me. Nancy Van Dorp is a CT, DP, OCELT, and developer, senior trainer, and PTCP instructor with the Learn IT to Teach team. She teaches culture, computers, and business courses at Sheridan College and McMaster University. Uh, Nancy is an advocate of using technology in all of its forms to support learning, and if you've been to Tesla Ontario conferences in the past few years, you may have been able to attend one of Nancy's many workshops and presentations. Thank you, Nancy, for spending a bit of time with me uh, today to talk about what's become a rather huge buzzword in K-12 and higher education, personalized learning, or more uh, appropriately, technology-enhanced personalized learning. Nancy's got a lot of experience in this uh, field, so I'm honored to have her with me today to uh, give her perspective and her, um, her expertise on, on this uh, very hot topic. Zoom. Okay, so we have Nancy Van Dorp with us uh, today. It's a hot August day, so I'm not sure what the temperature is going to be like when you watch this, but I can hear the sound of the lawnmowers outside right now, So, um, and it's sweltering, <laughs> sweltering where I am. How about where you are, Nancy? Oh, yes, quite hot here, too. <laughs> yeah, we'll look back at this fondly in uh, January. So, yeah, I remember when it was 30 degrees. <laughs> I remember when. <laughs> Okay, so we've been talking about personalized learning and in particular technology enhanced personalized learning. Um, if you've watched the first part of the presentation, you'll see kind of what, what I mean about personalized learning. But uh, Nancy, I'd really like to get your ideas, your perspectives. What does personalized learning mean to you? Well, personalized learning um, really means a way to reach your students and give them, I think, the best possible learning experience because it's not a one size fits all. And it certainly is the direction I think that education is heading and technologies just enables that to happen. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Um, 
So we know, Nancy, we know that you've worked with a number of different platforms. Uh, can you tell us, uh, I mean, personalized learning doesn't necessarily have to be connected to technology, but like I said, we've used it with technology um, and in particular some learning management systems. What uh, systems have you worked with in the past? Um, well, I've worked with Moodle, I've worked with Desire to Learn, I've worked with WebCT, and I've worked with Canvas. So um, quite, a, quite a few of the major ones out there. Okay. Do you have any preferences? Um, I have a preference for Moodle and for mm -hmm. Desire to Learn. Um, possibly because I have done most of my extensive uh, building in those two platforms. So I'm very familiar with them and I find them um, most flexible uh, for what, I'm, what I want to do. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I've worked with some of the same platforms. I've also worked uh, in Edmodo and Schoolology. Um, oh, yes. I did them um, just for one term and then I switched over to Google Classroom. Google Classroom, of course, isn't a learning management system but it's kind of more, um, I guess, a repository or forum. But it's, I don't know, there, there's lots of uh, platforms out there anyway that you can that you can use. So we know that you're working with edulink.org. Um, yes, can, <laughs> can, it's still excellent. Um, can you tell us how edulink.org helps to enable personalized learning for the students? Um, well, it's it's really awesome when these things have always been a part of EduLink and when you take out the topic of personalized learning, you can see all of the things you already know. A lot of them are already present in edulink.org. So first of all, students can learn at their own pace. Um, in edulink.org, they can repeat activities as often as they would like. Um, instructors can set up their courses so that you can release items under the activity completion and access uh, restrict, restricted access settings so that items don't get released till students unless and until they have met uh, certain criteria that you set out. Um, it's also mobile friendly, so it's very personalized. Students can walk with it around on their smartphones or tablets. And lately, we have been adding uh, functionality into EduLink so that teachers can create multi path lessons so that students can go down a path that is personalized if they need remedial work, if they um, are just standard uh, learning or if they are on an advanced track. And that also helps with the pacing and also um, helps teachers use the technology and set it up so that students can go down any of the path. And I think that in the next couple of years, you will see a lot more personalized learning functionality coming um, about in EduLink. Oh, that's fantastic. That's definitely something that, um, well, I know that if you're working in the PBLA system, uh, student needs and student directed learning, that's a big part of it. So I think these, I mean, and that's hard to do in, if you're if you're not using technology and you're, you're in a class with 30 students, you know, oh, how, <laughs> how, how, how do you even begin? <laughs> Yes, it uh, it certainly lets you put the thought into it ahead of time and set it up and then be able to reuse those structures multiple times with multiple students wherever they are in that path. So um, just a ton of flexibility and a, a ton of very targeted learning to, uh, to students there. Yeah, um, uh, this is definitely something that I, I want to continue to pursue, but I know that for some instructors, um, just getting started using a learning management system or a blended learning approach, it can seem like a lot. It can seem like a huge learning curve for the teacher. Uh, any advice you have for the instructors just kind of getting their feet wet, what they should do first? Um, well, I usually tell any uh, teachers that I am mentoring that you just have to dig deep and find patience. <laughs> um, and not just with the technology, because of course, we all know technology can be frustrating at times, but finding patience within yourself. Um, 
it helps make you a better instructor. It helps let you bring more computer literacy to your students. And if you take things one step at a time, go slowly, don't be afraid to be curious, explore what is out there. And um, having that patience always is, uh, I think, really a key to getting into and then being successful while doing um, anything when it comes to uh, educational technology. Yeah, I agree. And, and I'd also suggest not for new teachers or teachers that are just getting started, not to beat themselves up if they make a mistake. Because you know how many mistakes I've made? <laughs> um, and we make them all the time, but we tend to look at the more accomplished teachers and instructors and say, wow, this, this person's, you know, perfect. But, but no, 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 you don't get where you are unless you've, you know, <laughs> you know, made a lot of mistakes, right? Oh, absolutely. I have made my share. I continue to make my share. I continue to really have to think through some things or try to figure out if something isn't going right but having that curiosity and just knowing everybody is doing the same thing um so pace yourself uh it's not a race <laughs> it's uh it's more of a journey and the more that you do accomplish i think you you gain confidence and i think that you feel um more confident working with your students with it too yeah, and it, and it makes us more empathetic. The students are also going to have a learning curve, and they're also going to be making mistakes. So I think um, when the students know that, you know, the teacher's not perfect either. <laughs> so, you know, it's we're working on this together, right? Oh, for sure. And coming right out and saying that, I'm new to this too. <laughs> There's nothing wrong uh, with that. You uh, will have a lot of understanding if that's the case. <laughs> Yeah, well, I found that um, in my with my students that uh, I have a, a wide range of students that, you know, prior knowledge and expertise. And I've got students that have had computer science backgrounds <laughs> and these 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 students are, you know, easily able to work through the courses and the online stuff and to help their peers and to help me <laughs> when things go wrong. So yeah. taking advantage and getting to know what your students already know and, and using that prior knowledge to help, I think, is also a good a good thing. Yeah, and that's, of course, one of the adult learning principles that um, we should all follow, you know, bending into that experience and using it for the benefit of uh, everyone around you. Yeah, another thing about um, Moodle and some of the other learning management systems that's really interesting um, are learner, learner analytics. Now, um, yes. I'm not a computer scientist by any means. So, you know, I've kind of stumbled on learner analytics and, and just kind of use them to kind of see how patterns, uh, the, my student learning patterns are. But what do you know and what can you tell instructors about, <clears throat> sorry, how accessing learner analytics can help provide them insight into how our students um, learn? Well, like you, um, I have come more recently to analytics and trying to see, you know, what is the benefit to it and how is this going to help me? How is this going to help my students? And I've noticed a couple of uh, trends or patterns in it. And the big uh, leap, of course, is that before we used to rely on anecdotal um, information. So, oh yes, I think I saw this person doing this seat work, you know, 15 times before uh, they got it right or they had help doing it um, or whatever. So we're moving away from the anecdotal, I have to um, watch everything happen to let your students um, be observed, and I put that in air quotes, um, <laughs> from a data perspective and then as an instructor you can go back and look at that data so for example some of the analytics you can pull up have to do with how many times a student has retaken a quiz how many attempts have they had so it's one thing to see that someone got your two students get a score of 10 out of 10 on something one has taken it five times one has taken it once 
what does that tell you about your student? All of a sudden, you have data where before you said, yes, you had it perfect, but you didn't realize it was taking five times to get to that. Now you can find that out. You can, you know, on the other hand, go in and see if a uh, student is not doing some of the preliminary work that you have asked them to do. So it's like, oh, well, that is interesting too. So when it comes time to say, oh, you did not do very well on this assessment, then suddenly you'll say, oh, but, you know, you would have known that if you had actually Mm -hmm. watch these. And so you have the hard data to go with it. And the analytics are there. You can look at how much time is spent on task. Um, and this really helps with PBLA because it um, can help promote accountability uh, mm -hmm. for the student. So that they'll say when you're having your progression meeting or you're looking at your other information, you have data to support it and you can um, talk about it. You've got evidence there that says, you know, what you can have and your students can know that you have this and it's not like they can get away with things. Mm -hmm. So the analytics can really, um, and you can go really, really deep into analytics and I won't um, uh, pretend to know that I know the deepest of analytics, mm -hmm. but you can certainly spend some time digging into reports and pulling the data that helps you. The ones I've mentioned here are just sort of the easier things that you can do that will have an immediate um, help to you. And certainly as you're starting out, that's where I would suggest um, would be mm -hmm. a good place to look. Yeah, the basics, right? So, you know, if someone's having a difficulty doing a certain task, but has never completed any of the skill builders uh, that lead up to the task, that can be one thing that, you know, the teacher can can help and say, well, maybe go over this and, you know, that sort of thing as well. Another thing I noticed about analytics is, um, uh, in Moodle too and in Canvas was that the timing, you can see when students are logging on. Nice. Um, and then you're like, oh my God, my students have such busy lives. They're doing their work at two, three o'clock in the morning all the time. So it kind of gives me a bit more um, insight into their patterns. Yes, that, that's a, that's another uh, analytic just to, to watch and see. Yeah. Uh, I think we've already talked about this, but um, advantages for the instructor and the student in setting up an online course, such as edulink.org. Oh, well, this is mm -hmm. a topic that is very <laughs> dear to my heart. It's very close to me because I think the advantages are so numerous to the instructor, to the student. Um, obviously on edulink.org, we have ready-made content uh, already available. It's aligned to the CLBs, the link curriculum. Um, so it's not like you have to start building things from scratch. Um, Learn IT to Teach provides free training um, as to using it. So it's not like you have to put out money to set something up. And we uh, are also able to give professional development hours uh, for mm -hmm. that sort of learning. Um, as an instructor, when you're setting it up, it's great to have a mentor. It's great to be able to ask people questions. And we have a live help widget on our homepage where a member of the team will be online and you can ask an an a question and get an answer right away. So having the support there um, is a lot of benefit to setting up because you're not isolated. You're not out there on your own. When you get into the courseware itself, there are no ads. You can have a safe place. You're not letting um, students loose on the internet to follow whatever links uh, that they want. And you're also giving your students an opportunity to develop their computer literacy skills. So it's a question of, you know, they may have some, they may need more, you may have to um, start off with how to set up a, a free email account on Google or something, but you can help make them essentially more employable in the workplace by 
setting up and using a blended classroom where there is face-to-face -face and there is also computers. I don't think anyone uh, today would deny that computers are here to stay. And so it's um, full steam ahead. And I think we almost do a disservice to our students if we don't somehow incorporate um, computers into their learning. And of course, we know that many, many students have smartphones, they have tablets, they can take things on um, and personalize their learning. Um, as you mentioned, Jen, access can be done anytime, any place. So we can see if they, you know, come online after, you know, doing a late night shift of work or something like this. And with the ability to personalize learning, uh, we're able to reach different levels uh, in a classroom uh, for different skills. We have different intakes. We have different goals um, through PBLA that have been identified. So trying to run all this without the help of technology um, is challenging. And once we can overcome the challenges with a bunch of supports to get an online class, um, I just see a lot of benefits, a lot of upside for students and for teachers. Oh yeah, I, I definitely agree. I mean, many of the workplace workplace training, even in, in retail and entry-level jobs, the training is online. You go on, you do your WMIS training, you do your health and safety training and, and everything else um, online and, and, and through a different kind of learning management system. Many, many workplaces are, are doing this now. So giving our students that heads up and that advantage and, and starting to learn in an environment um, like this is, is a really good start. And it's awesome for the teachers. I started off with Learn IT to Teach. Um, I've since used other platforms, but, but I can definitely attest to the fact that having that live support and uh, having the, the mentors readily available to answer questions, that, that made all the difference. It's kind of, you know, solved some frustration and uh, provided some encouragement and, and it's just been a fantastic experience. Oh, great. Glad to hear. Yes. Uh, was there anything else that you wanted to, to say about personalized learning and using technology for our adult language learners? Um, I would just like uh, just to reiterate that it really uh, is the way the future is going. I think that it would be um, difficult to turn your head and say, oh, this is just a fad, it's going to go away, um, because that's not where technology is allowing us to go. And it's not where the research has shown that students uh, need instruction that is applicable to them in the moment, uh, in the now. And by ignoring or thinking that personalized learning uh, isn't where it's going, you're you're really taking your chances on on getting lost on the you know the direction I think that education is going with technology. Yeah, I mentioned at the beginning that it is a, a huge buzzword in K twelve and higher ed. It hasn't really kind of jumped the border or uh, into adult and continuing education yet. But but I agree with you. I see it coming, and I think that. Um, we need to at least uh, figure out a way to to make it work for us and for our particular audience of learners. Yes, um, I attended the ISTE uh, conference uh, this summer mm -hmm. in Chicago, and I can tell you, and it it um, contained uh, twenty five thousand some odd educators from around the world, and it spans everything from K to 12 and higher ed mm -hmm. and absolutely personalized learning was on everyone's lips. So there is no doubt in my mind that uh, this is where the industry is going. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, with any technology, you know, you know I mean, I've, I went to ISTE the year before in San Antonio and yeah, it's a phenomenal experience. It's a little, <laughs> it's a little mind blowing actually. And, and you tend to, I mean, there's a lot of, um, edutech companies and of course they're 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 offering their products and their opinions and whatnot um but so i think um that said that you know we need to kind of look at how it's going to work 
personalized learning with our particular audience and with our particular set of learners. So what might work in K-12 might not necessarily fit with us and, and you know, vice versa. But I definitely think there's, there's the future is leading us in that direction. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Nancy, for joining me on this presentation. I think this is just the beginning, to be honest. I think that we're going to see a whole lot more um, at conferences coming up. Are you going to be going to the Tesla Ontario conference this fall? Oh, yes, absolutely. We'll be at uh, Tesla Ontario. Also, we'll be attending a Tesla um, oh. in Alberta. It's in Edmonton uh, this year in October. So that will be before. And uh, so we'll look forward to having uh, more chats about uh, EdTech at these conferences. As always, I, I know that Tesla Ontario this year is having a, a panel uh, discussion on educational technology. I haven't heard too much more about it, but I really hope to see you there. <laughs> I hope to be part of it too, but uh, I think that that will uh, be some really interesting and, and useful conversation that our, our members, uh, that we need to have. Yes, absolutely. And I am so looking forward to it and uh, would invite anyone to open conversations with me anytime um, because I, uh, I feel really passionate about uh, education and technology, um, as I know a lot of people do, but uh, I'm uh, certainly putting myself out there for it. So <laughs> me too. Well, you can find Nancy on Twitter. Uh, you find me on Twitter as well. If you have any questions about this presentation, uh, what's your Twitter handle, Nancy? I didn't uh, it's include it there. at Nancy Van Dorp. <laughs> well, that's that's pretty simple. So yeah, at Nancy Van Dorp, and I'm at Jen Artan. So if you have any questions or comments you want to add to it, uh, certainly get in touch with us. And thank you so much, Nancy. Uh, you were one of our very first presenters for Tesla Ontario's webinar, also the 75th <laughs> presenter, and the very first interview that we've done through the webinar uh, best practices series. So a lot of uh, benchmarks or first, first, first marks or whatever you call them for Nancy. Thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Have a great day. Thanks, you too.